My demographics, what do I mean by that? I'm going to shorthand the definition to mean aging and shrinking populations. But what are the long-term implications of this? And what can be done about this now as a policy matter? It's very complicated. And the reason why I ask it at the European Business School, as opposed to the European Demographic School, where is that, by the way? Is that down the road? <laughs> On the other side of the river. On the other side of the river, yeah. There's one as often. Um, it's because this. You don't normally associate aging, shrinking societies with economic and therefore societal might on a global scale. So this is a long-term question, but it requires policy fixes now, investments in smart public policy. And again, this is not like the United States has figured this out, believe me. We're known as an immigrant nation, and I think we earn that badge of honor some days better than others. Native Americans, African Americans, Millions of illegal, uh, largely Latino uh, residents don't see it quite that way, with all due respect. Our health care debate is a proxy for our demographic realities. But in Europe, and Germany is the country in Europe that I know the best, what are the implications? I think, think about this yourself, challenge this. Big implications. If you've got more people leaving the workforce than coming into it, the group that comes into it better be more productive. If you do nothing about growing your population, I'll come to that in a second, you better make that group really productive. Huge implications, therefore, in education. Is the, is the public education system in this country right? Uh, huge implications on not just Bildung, but Ausbildung, or Vita Ausbildung. Uh, when people are pivoting from one industry to another. <clears throat> Big implications of th in things like the healthcare debate, which Germany is having, I think, quite rightfully and quite intelligently. Big implications on who shares the burden. How much burden, never mind how productive you all are in this room, but how much burden will you be asked to share for aging societies? Big question in the United States as well. How much burden goes from state to individual? How can you manage that? And then you talk about how can you get, how can you reverse the trend? Are there meaningful ways to reverse the trend? And ask yourself of those realistic ways. Can you amp up immigration? That's one of the ways the US has been able to be aging but not shrinking. What do you do in terms of integration and making that one plus one equals three as productive as possible of the immigrant communities that are already here. What can be done to address the sort of, I don't know if Hob Hobson, is it a Hobson's choice? The dilemma that so many professional women apparently, I'm told, face in this country uh, uh, as evidenced by birth rate between being a mother and being successful. Can we find ways and by the way, the implications on fathers should be a question we should ask as well. Can we find a way for people to have it both ways? France is a much higher birth rate as an example. What are they doing that other countries can learn from? Again, these are hardly just issues in Germany. But demographics, big question. I'm a big free trader. I believe at the end of the day, free trade is the only way to go. However, I also believe two other things. Number one, a lesson we learned with NAFTA, which is the North American Free Trade Agreement, Canada, US, Mexico, is if you're gonna embrace free trade, and I believe you should, you have to go into that embrace with your eyes open that you'll have dislocations that you have to have immediate policy available to address. And if you don't, you can't embrace free trade. So um, it's, a, it's a circular dilemma. I am strongly of the opinion we need free trade, but I will say that we must have the policy to address the dislocations, and those dislocations are almost always labor-related. Retraining, re-education, mobility issues. 
Last thing, the other reality is we talk, we, we talk a lot about free trade, the Doha round. It gets a lot of headlines about why it's happened and why it hasn't happened. What we need to have, this is a little bit echoing back to the Kyoto Protocol in the climate discussions in 1997, everybody's got to be at the table. We just can't have, in my opinion, one-offs, regional deals, and the gap between the, um, the developed and the emerging markets, including the big gorilla, large emerging markets, we've got to get that right as it relates to trade. It can't just be trade between Germany and America. We'll get that right. Occasionally we'll have disputes, but we'll get it right. You believe, how likely is it that we will be living in a world without nuclear pressure? I think it is, it is we, we have a real likelihood, but we have to do it right. Uh, the president laid out sort of the overarching themes in his speech in Prague last spring. It got an enormous amount of support in Germany uh, and, and elsewhere, but I know in Germany. But it has to be done right. And it has to be done carefully and step by step by step. So we can't all of a sudden start making decisions that are marginal, if you will, outside of the broader context and game plan. But I am very optimistic it can be achieved. My last example, Willy Brandt, the iconic photo on his knees, December 7th or December 12th, 1970, I think December 12th, 1970, in front of the memorial, uh, of the, uh, the memorial in Warsaw to the Warsaw Ghetto uprising, the 233 individuals who were killed. Brought on his knees, December 1970. When he was asked, was that planned? He said, no, I did what all men do when words fail. Ten months later, he was awarded the Nobel Prize for Peace. He was criticized for being Ostpol for Ostpolitik, principally, reaching out to the East, repairing the damage, trying to find common ground, engagement. He was criticized for more talk than results, for being young, for being a chancellor for only a couple of years and for pursuing something that was of English chaotic, sort of a dream. I would argue not only because of Willy Brandt, and thank God he lived to see this, but for many other reasons. First and foremost, because of the people from the bottom up. But the ultimate evidence, result, proof, vindication of Ostpolitik was on November 9th, 1989. 18 years, almost to the day, after he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Some stuff takes time. President Obama, young, first year in office, criticized for being naive, maybe unpatriotic to talk about nuclear weapons, but if you look at why he won the Nobel Prize, it was engagement, and it was specifically the Prague speech and the path forward that he's laid out. Like Ostpolitik, it will take a long time to achieve. That doesn't mean it isn't vitally worthy. And it doesn't mean that we have to wait till the end to reward the guys and gals who got us on the road to that result in the beginning. Thank you all very much.